So the book of Mark is a story about Jesus. And I hope during the time that we are digging into the book of Mark, it leads you to not only fall more in love with Jesus, to know how amazing it is that he's loved us, but that also we would ask that question, how closely am I following him? Do I know about Jesus as an intellectual exercise, or do I really feel like I know him relationally? Am I connected? And we are looking this week at how Jesus picks his team. We have a short segment, and there are, in each gospel, a little bit about these 12 guys that he chose to walk with him, to work with him, and eventually to continue the ministry that he had started, to really be world changers. And what we want to look at is how unlikely it was who he chose and how encouraging that is to us. So, when I was in grade school, we played kickball all the time. And you know how you go out for recess, you know how you pick teams? You have what's called a schoolyard pick. You pick two people, and then they start choosing people down the line. And you just hope you won't be last, you know? Or, or that terrible place where they say, you can take both of them. <laughs> like, they're totally negligible to the outcome of this game. And then one day, I got to be one of the ones who chose the teams. And I remember that momentary... Should I choose the guy that's really good? Or there's my friend over there saying, pick me, pick me, pick me. I don't want to be last. So do you pick somebody who's really skillful or do you pick your friend? And I think when you look at how Jesus picked his team, he didn't use the who is the most influential and powerful and intellectual and educated and who is the guy that can help me get elected. He chose the people that would have been, you take the rest of them. And that doesn't um, maybe make us too prideful when we say he chose us, but I think it should take away some of our excuses for how it is that we believe that God can do great things with us. So I'm going to start in Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 13. And I want us to drill down a little bit on what each of the, the disciples that we know about and how we can learn about God's plan, not only for them, but for us. So we're starting in verse 13. It says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, part of the reason the study of the disciples is a little confusing is they seem to have this name game where they keep running around by two different names. So Levi is also known as Matthew. And it sounds like Jesus just haphazardly walks by and goes, oh, he looks like a good one and just chooses him. But remember I told you Mark is the gospel that just gives us the, the action. He doesn't really focus on too many of the details. So we, we need to go to some of the other gospels to find some of the details and to let you know how we know there's more to the story, last weekend we talked about Jesus chose the fishermen from Galilee, Andrew and Peter, James and John. And it sounds again like he just walks by, sees some guys out there throwing their nets, and it's like, oh, you, like, you guys look like you could be good followers. And we know the backstory on that. Andrew was actually a follower of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist was down on the Jordan, down closer to Jerusalem way away from Galilee. And he went down there, and he was a disciple of John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist said to, about Jesus, there's the Lamb of God that's going to take away the sin of the world, Andrew switched from following John the Baptist to following Jesus. And he went and told his brother Peter, we have found the Messiah. And so Peter was involved and engaged at that level. And, and so there was this conversation and this listening to Jesus teach and following him and getting to know him. And then Jesus moves his base of operations up near the Sea of Galilee, which if you've ever been there, you will always think of as a lake after this. It's just a nice, beautiful lake. And he's up there, and he then calls these men. In fact, the scriptures tell us, one of the other uh, gospels tells us that he spent all night in prayer, that there were a group of people that were following him and believing to some degree that he was the Messiah. And so he prayed 
which is a cool picture of Jesus, the Son of God, spent all night with his Father talking about who am I going to choose for these critically important positions. And so then he goes out and he begins to challenge them. So my assumption is that Levi also, living in the small town of Capernaum, he knows about Jesus. He's, maybe you've heard him speak that there's this a relationship that has begun and now there's that moment where Jesus said, now it's time. And he leaves his profession and he follows Jesus. Now, if you leave your fishing nets, you can always go back. There's always fish there. You are always going to be skilled as a fisherman. You can go back to your employment. If you have been collecting taxes for the Roman government and you walk away from your booth, it's probably a permanent transition. He, he was making a life-altering choice. And I want us to walk through Jesus' choice of Levi because he did not definitely choose the popular. He didn't choose the powerful, the influential. He chose Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans. Let me put that in perspective for you. When Nazi Germany had taken over all of their neighbors in Holland specifically, in several other countries, there were different reactions to this powerful Nazi regime coming in. And some people just folded and went along and they tried to keep their position in the government and all of a sudden they became Nazis. And they were called collaborators. They cooperated with this Nazi regime that had overcome the, the country that they, had been, that they lived in, Holland, for example. Then there were other people who were called the resistance, and they were the ones that were risking their lives, and they were, some of them stories that we know were hiding the Jewish people in their homes so that they weren't killed, and some of them were actually giving information to the allies, and some of them were blowing up bridges and actually involved in a, in a sort of a guerrilla warfare. So can you imagine what happens after the Allies win and the Nazis are kicked out. And in Holland, they took the men that had been collaborators with the Nazis and they took them out and shot them. And they took the women and they shaved their heads and they, they were disgraced. And you realize the feeling between those two groups of people, those who cooperate with the regime that takes over and those who are in resistance against it, how do you think that relationship is ever going to come together? And I say that to lay a groundwork for the fact that Levi is a collaborator. That the Romans came in and they crushed the Jewish resistance and they took over by force. It took them three years of siege to win the city of Jerusalem. And Herod is established as the king from Rome and they send out their people and they demand a cut from everything. They're making people pay. And they use Jewish people to collect taxes from their own people. So, number one, they're collaborating with a foreign dominant government that's been merciless, killing thousands. And then they are known to be shysters. If the Roman government says you have to give a 20% tax, they could say, we'll make it 30. And they keep the extra 10% for themselves and who's going to argue with them? They have the might of the Roman army behind them. So let me tell you, I'm doubtful that any tax collectors are going to win popular contests, no matter what country they're from. But if you are coming from the kind of regime that they had set up, can you imagine how the other disciples felt when Jesus added Levi to the roster? Those who were independent and wanted the country back and hated the Romans and all of a sudden you have a collaborator that is added to the mix. I think it's very, very important for you and I to look at why we care about people. Why do we love people? And I believe that within five minutes of a conversation of people, most of you have put a label on them and either rejected them or accepted them. And generally, we have really an underlying question. Are they like me or are they not like me? And people who are not like me, we have a great tendency to, if not reject outright, to be definitely cynical about. 
And Jesus brings Matthew right into the circle of his inner circle of disciples. And the next story after that tells us part of why Jesus did that. So Jesus invites Levi to follow him. Levi leaves his desk, takes off and becomes a follower of Jesus. And then he invited Jesus to his home. He had a party at his house. And guess who comes to a tax collector's party? Not people he has taxed, right? So he invites him in and says, while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him. I'm not sure that was the name tag they wore. I'm a sinner, but they were considered the outcasts. And it says they were eating with him as disciples, for there were many who followed him. Jesus was comfortable with people who had been rejected. Jesus was comfortable with people who were outcasts. Jesus was comfortable. The Holy Son of God was okay sitting at table with the sinners, with us. Yeah. And I think people go different ways on that. Some people say, well, sure, I go out party with my friends. Jesus hung out with sinners. And so there's a critically important question here. Are you established enough in your faith where you are drawing people towards Jesus or are they drawing you back into the life you were in before? And, and a caveat, honestly, when you first come to faith is you probably need to make some separation. People say, do I have to reject my friends? I tell them, just start talking about Jesus and they will reject you. <laughs> or not. Yeah. Or they will listen. So there is some time you need to be separate so that you can... Stand against all the habits that you were caught in before. But let me tell you, I think the greater danger for most of us is that after you've been a Christian a long time, you become so isolated from real people who don't know Jesus that we don't have any substantive relationships with people who are not followers of Jesus. That we are uncomfortable with people who are not like us. And Jesus who we are following, was comfortable with this group of people. He wasn't getting pulled into their behavior, but he was being the light in the darkness. And so, because he chose Levi, and because Levi chose him, there's a whole circle of people that are now open to Jesus. I kind of wondered as I read through it, I wonder if Matthew and Zacchaeus knew each other. They were tax collectors from different towns, but if you were a tax collector, there's probably a small circle of people on your Christmas card list. (laughs) So maybe they were connected, but certainly they were in the same boat. And some people have taken this passage and they have said, wouldn't it be cool if we could do Levi dinners? That we would invite Jesus and our unbelieving friends. So one of the things we're talking about at Family Church is what would it be like if we started doing block parties in the summer? where the Christians who live closer to each other would get together and invite all their neighbors, not so you can surprise them with a gospel presentation in the middle. You ever been to one of those parties? Yeah. But so that you can be Jesus with them. So that you can connect with your neighbors on a different wavelength. There's other ways to do it. There's a friend of mine that put up a Facebook page, and she said, We go to the half shell, the music on the half shell in the summer. Let's combine our circles of friends. And she invited the people from her life group and she invited the people from her work. And they would figure out where they were going to sit in going to the half shell. Just a way to say, let's have a redemptive relationship. Let's connect with these people. Let's be Jesus in the world. As we talked through this, one of my friends said, I don't really want to do Levi dinners. I want to do a Levi life. I want to be that kind of a person that connects with people, not just if they already believe in Jesus and they already agree with me and and they're the same political party and they're the same belief about everything. You know, the sad thing is Christians can't even get along with other Christians that disagree with them. And Jesus is an example of loving people who are not at all like him. So there's an important part of this that we need to learn how to follow. 
And then it says, here's the opposition. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked the disciple, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? That was not an informational question. Let me read it differently. Why in the world does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Who does he think he is? I, I thought he was supposed to be a rabbi and a holy man, and can't he tell what vermin they are? Can he tell that those are the scum of the earth? That's the tone. And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Amen. It's not the healthy. Was it because the Pharisees were healthy? No. It's because the door to spiritual life is through humility. And if you don't know you have a problem, then you are not interested in the solution. Or maybe more honestly, if you will not admit you have a problem. If you go to the doctor and you won't tell him your symptoms and you won't tell him what you're doing and you won't tell him about your lifestyle, how much help is he going to be to you? Yeah, yeah zero. So Jesus said, those people who think I, they don't need God, they don't need me, they don't need salvation, they don't need any of that, I can't do a thing for them. But the people who know they're screwed up, the people who are broken, the people who are hurting, the people who are lost... That's the ones I can do something for. Listen, they were both lost. The Pharisees and the tax collectors were both lost. Yeah. Only one of them realized it or was willing to admit it. Which says that if we're going to see Jesus work in our life, we need to start with honesty about where we are broken and what we need and how sick we are because we need a doctor. It also means that we need to have a church that's more focused on being a hospital than being a museum where people come and show off their sanctification. Which means in our life groups, we need to be honest about when we're struggling, and what's going on, and what doubts we're having, and what hurts we have, and what's really going on, instead of all of that shiny facade stuff. And Jesus said, I came for those who really need me. What happens when you do that? You get a reaction. He got a reaction not only from the Pharisees and the teacher of the law, he is called to meet people that have real needs and real hurts and real brokenness. And interestingly enough, when you do that, there will often be a reaction, rejection. He was rejected not only by the religious people of his day, it made him unpopular with his own family. That's a warning to you. If you genuinely follow Jesus, there may be some people even in your family circle that give you grief. Amen to that. And I don't say be obnoxious about your following of Jesus. I'm just saying be prepared. Look at what happens to Jesus. And then Jesus went, entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. He had become so famous that people were just thronging around him. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said he's out of his mind. If there was anybody in the world that knew Jesus was born of a virgin, it was Mary. I don't think she was going because she didn't think he was special or a holy man or because he, maybe even she believed he was the Son of God. I think she went because he was not being the kind of Messiah she thought he ought to be. Does God do things that you think he shouldn't do or not do things that you think you should do? Yeah. And I think she's playing that protective mother bear. This guy's getting in trouble and everything's going to come unraveled and I better go rescue him. And she and the boys went down to find Jesus. And you're, they said to Jesus, your mother and brothers are outside. And he said, as he looked at his disciples, these are my mother and my brothers. These are my family. I think that was tearing and rending. It's wonderful that Jesus' brothers, we know some of them came to follow him and to lead churches and to write books. But at this point, they thought he was out of his mind because he wasn't being the kind of Messiah that they thought he ought to be. Then I want to go on and look at the rest of the disciples and show that Jesus picked those who were unlikely. Jesus went up on the mountainside and he called to him, he called to him those he wanted and they came to him. And he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that they might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So he goes up to the mountainside. He spends the time praying. 
He is looking to choose those who are going to follow him, who will make such an incredible difference in the world. Obviously, a critically important decision. And then it says, these are the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. James, the son of Zebedee and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. I'll explain that in a second. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. That's the twelve. We only know things of about five or six of them, except in historical records. But this is the group that he picked. They were not all the same as each other. They were all Jewish men, but they were from mostly from the Galilee area, but from some other areas. But I want to just point out what differences there were because I think we over-romanticize this idea that Jesus had these disciples and they traveled with him. Wouldn't it be wonderful to live with Jesus? You realize he picked 12 knotheads to live with, to eat with every meal of the day, to sleep overnight, sometimes in homes, sometimes out in the countryside. And they were together together. Three years, 24-7. Can you imagine putting up with Peter for a week? (laughs) And you start thinking about who it was that he'd called. And over on the right side of your notes, there's just a few of them. And it says James and John, or excuse me, Andrew and Simon Peter, they were fishermen, not known for having high education or etiquette. James and John were also fishermen, but they're called sons of thunder. Now, we don't know exactly what that means, but we get one little clue when they're going through Samaria and they're headed to Jerusalem and the Samaritans would not sell them any food because they were Jewish people headed to Jerusalem. They, they were shunning them. And so James and John in their very spiritual moment said, Jesus, can we call down fire from heaven to destroy these two towns? I'm not sure that's a prayer you've ever prayed. Maybe you've been tempted, but... I think they were called sons of thunder because they're volatile temperaments. And then Simon the Zealot. Now, zealous means you're on fire for something. But the Zealots were a political party. The Zealots were another group that were so opposite from the collaborators. This was the resistance who actually went out. Some of them carried knives. They advocated armed overthrow of the Romans. Some of them killed Romans. Can you imagine the conversation that Simon the Zealot would have had with Matthew the tax collector? You think that ever came up? Yeah. See, I don't know if you think about this, but often when you choose your friends, you pick people that are like you, that agree with you, that that have the same views and the same lifestyle and the same hobbies and the same interests and same age group and the same age kids and... Our choices is often we try to get people as much like us as possible. (laughs) You know why? Because we already love ourselves, and it's easier to love people that are just like us. And I just want to show you that Jesus did not do that, and I think it's extremely intentional. That the sons of thunder, and and the Simon the Zealot, and Thomas the Pragmatic, who was also the doubter, and Judas Iscariot, who was the betrayer, who, interestingly enough, is the one that held the treasury, the, bag, the money bag for the group, and was a thief. Yeah. <laughs> one of our pastors said, isn't it interesting that they didn't ask the tax collector to be the accountant? <laughs> I'm not sure what it was about that, but we know what kind of people they were. We know what kind of conversations happened because quite often, Jesus would ask them, what were you guys talking about when we were walking along the way? Because he acted like he didn't listen. It's a great technique for high schoolers and junior highers, by the way. Just drive the car, leave the kids in the back, act like you can't hear a thing. You'll learn amazing things. He just would listen to them. And then he would have these little conversations. What were you talking about? Um, um, um. We were talking about who was going to be the greatest when you came into your kingdom. You see, they were positioning themselves. They thought Jesus was going to take over and be a, a physical human ruler. And so they were trying to get themselves so they could have a position in that new government. And there's one story where James and John's mother comes and she says, Jesus, would you give me this request that my sons could sit at your right and your left? 
And, and the part of that story I love is it says, when the other ten heard about it, they were indignant. And to myself, I'm thinking, it's because they hadn't thought of it first. <laughs> Man, that was a great trick. Get your mom to go, get him on a soft moment. Yeah. And what Jesus told them is, that's not mine to give. But they didn't understand. They didn't understand what Jesus was saying half the time. Jesus said to them, beware of the leaven or the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, meaning the, the falseness of their teaching. And the disciples looked at each other and said, did you bring the bread? I thought you were going to bring the bread. For three years he was with them. And they were like this, arguing about who was going to be greatest. Every time he did a great miracle, they're like, whoa, he really is the Son of God. Like it was a surprise. And those are the people that Jesus chose. And I believe that we tend to think that if I can get everybody like me and everybody to agree with me, then my life will be good. And I'm telling you the opposite, that God intentionally puts people in your life that are not like you because that's the crucible in which you can grow spiritually. Amen. That The relational tension is part of God's transforming process. Write that down, would you? That the relational tension that God allows with your neighbors, with your fellow students, with your husband or wife, with your kids, with your parents, it's so easy for us to say, I would be a better person if I just had better people around me. I do want you to know I would be a better pastor if I had better people. I, I definitely know that. Isn't it how quickly we blame our faults on other people instead of, we say, you made me mad. That's one of the favorites. You made me mad. Huh. I didn't know I was in control of your emotions. And Jesus wants us to deal with people that are different than we are. He wants that relational tension to be part of our growth. So if you were to choose a team that was going to take on some important part and where you were going to be with them for three years, would you pick beavers and ducks to put together? <laughs> would you pick Democrats and Republicans to be put together? Would you put Baptists and Charismatics together? You see, I think as soon as you realize that, you realize I tend to choose people to come to my parties because they're like me and because they like me. So God is in the process of wanting to develop us. And not only were they not that connected to each other or very similar, they were also not that impressive. If Jesus was going to be coming the king, if he was trying to win a popular vote, he should have chosen people from Jerusalem and people that were involved already who were maybe part of the royal family or who were involved in the, the power circles and the circles of influence and wealth. He should have chosen better if that was his goal. In fact, at one point his brothers say, you ought to come down to the feast if you're trying to present yourself. This is a good place to do it. They, they were thinking political advantage. And Jesus chose people that were fishermen and tax collectors and ordinary people. And I think God loves to do that. And I think if we look at ourselves, we say he's still doing that. And in the book of Corinthians, he challenges them. He says, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things which are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Why did God choose us? It's not because he got such a great deal when he got us. It's because he loves us. And because when God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things, then he's the one that gets the glory. So I want to ask you a very important personal question. If I were to say to you in a private conversation, I think God has a great plan for you. I think God can use you in the lives of many people. I think God wants to show himself powerful in your life. What are the immediate excuses and reasons that come up in your head why that can't happen? I'm too old. I'm too inexperienced. 
I can't speak, I can't sing, I'm too young, I'm too whatever. We don't want to say I'm too lazy, I'm too sinful. I'm too <laughs> <coughs> Some of you say maybe if you, if you knew what my life was like before, you'd know why God can't use me now. And I'd think, wait a minute, like the Apostle Paul that killed Christians, are you in that category? And you see, I think everybody that God approached to do something great, they had excuses. And I think we are the same. God chose the disciples not because they were impressive, but He chose them because He was going to get the glory out of what God was going to do in their lives. And if you read the stories and even the histories, they ended up going to India, going to Ethiopia, going to Rome, going around the world. And the gospel went from one little town where people lived, where Jesus lived, to spreading over the whole world. There are literally billions of people today that have heard of Jesus because of the faithfulness of that small group. Can God do great things with ordinary people? Yeah, and I think you need to make that transition and say, can God do great things in my life? That's when it gets personal. And I want you to see the last part of this that really struck me, is they weren't called just to be pawns on his chessboard. They were called to be with him. Did you catch that as we went through that? It says he appointed the 12 that they might be with him. You see, they had to be with each other for three years, but they also got to be with Jesus for three years. And he rearranged their whole view of the world. He rearranged how they saw people. Can you imagine how they felt when a Roman centurion comes up and wants help? Can you imagine how Simon the Zealot felt about that? You see, he taught them a different way of looking at people. He taught them a different value system. They left their nets. They left their tax collecting booth. They left what had been important before. And they took on what was eternal and what was going to be lasting and what was going to be ultimately incredible. But why did he do it? He chose them to be with him. See, I think this is so important. And some people get this so backwards, especially if you've been in church a long time. We think God got me because I can need to serve Him. God doesn't need your service. He invites you into the privilege of being with Him. We did a series some years ago called Eden, and we talked about people who see themselves as over God, critiquing God or under God, just going along in sort of a, of a servile manner. But that the goal is for us to see ourselves as with Him. And you will begin to see your day through the lens that God loves you and wants a relationship with you and wants us to know Him. When you get to be with Him, then the other things come. It says they were with Him and then He sent them out to preach and cast out demons and there was impressive outflow. But it starts with the incredible intimate inflow. They were with Him. They become convinced of who he really is and that he had a relationship with them. John calls himself the one that Jesus loved. He was part of that inner circle and he writes in 1 John, God is love. How do we know that God is love? Because he sent his son. And if we are no God, then we are living in love. And he writes this whole epistle about love. Why? Because he'd been with Jesus. So my invitation is that you believe that God can do great things with you, but that you realize that step one is to be with Him and to let Him be with you. Then you can invite Him into your circle. Then you can be involved in serving and doing, but you're not doing it out of a sense of checklist obligation. You're doing it out of a, a wonder that He would call people like me to be part of this incredible, eternally changing enterprise. And when you begin to look at your day that way, you will never look at it the same again. I'm going to hand off to our campus down in Green in the South Umpqua and love you guys. Walk through these last couple of points here. Let me ask you those two simple questions that I've already hinted at. What keeps you from believing that God can use you? Is it past failure? Is it current addictions and habits? Is it a feeling of worthlessness or insufficiency or 
I don't have any great skills or any great ways God wants to use me. And I ask you to really come sick to the doctor, that you come with your, your illnesses and your brokenness and you say, Jesus, this is my excuses, this is my reasons, this is the way I see myself in my own head, and I surrender it to you, the doctor, so you can heal me, so you can convince me that you all love me and that every excuse I have, you have a counter for. And then I, I want to challenge you to think about the people that God's put in your life and challenge us to be people who live a Levi life, that we don't see people just by labels, by whether they're accomplished or they agree with me or whether they've got their life together. Isn't it interesting? We want to find people who've got their life together so we can tell them about Jesus and just have it to be a little add-on. And the people who just generally come are people who've got all their parts in a box and they're broken and they're needy and they really need Jesus, and they really need a church family, and they need people that will love them and not judge them, and, and people that will walk alongside of them. So my encouragement to you as we move towards Easter is that you begin to pray in the circle of people around you, in your school, in your job, in your neighborhood, in your family, that you begin to pray that God would show you who He wants you to connect with. Your idea of who's open may be really skewed. There may be a lot of people who are interested in spiritual things you have no idea because we're amazingly poor at perceiving what God is doing. And I encourage you to be praying for three or four people that God would use you to be Jesus in their life. And they may be tax collectors and they may be sinners. And you say, God, help me to get next to them and to love them and to be Jesus to them, to care about them, to believe that, God, you can do something in their lives. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the story of the disciples. Thank you for the humanness of them and the grittiness of the story and of them hanging out and walking and eating and, and being rejected at, at times and being in places where you're too popular and there's people all over. And in the middle of all that, God, you were trying to help rearrange their picture of greatness. And I pray for everybody here. Lord, if there are some who've never really seen you, they've never really developed a relationship with you, I pray that as we walk through the book of Mark that they might see you in a deeper and different way. And Lord, for those who've been upset with you because you haven't been the kind of Messiah that they thought you should be, I pray that they would surrender those preconceived ideas. And Father, for those of us who, who tend to look at our neighbors and call some of them unsavable and a lot of them unsavory, help us to see people like you see them, people that are valuable, people that you died for, people that you care about. And Father, help us to walk out of this place where we worship and study the Scriptures together and love each other and help us to walk out of here to be lights in the darkness. Father, we pray that you would do great things here, not because we are great, but because you are great, and we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video, and uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person, and I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say, we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging, and we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that, and we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.